Ellora perhaps is one of the most fascinating sites in India. Uh, nowhere else you can find monuments of all the major religions of ancient India in a single place. There are Buddhist caves, there are Brahmanical caves, there are Jain caves, and uh, even in Buddhism there are there are Mahayana caves, there are Vajrayana caves. So all these things together make it very very exciting. Uh, it is about 30 kilometers away from a place called Aurangabad. And there are so many other caves in this vicinity. Uh, all of you are aware that Ajanta is not quite far from Elora. Pital Kora is not quite far from Elora. There is a small cave uh, called Bokardan, which is also very close to it. So it seems that this particular area was quite full of uh, uh, this architectural activity right from 5th century till about 11th century. We are not very sure about the exact date of Elora because there is, there is a big debate about the uh, commencement of this work. Some of the scholars are of the opinion that it started with Buddhist culture. Some believe that Shaivite caves are the earliest caves of this site. I personally think that there is some Vaishnavite activity right next to uh, the waterfall near cave number 29 which could be one of, one of the earliest caves. Now it's uh, a little difficult to prove it, but uh, on the basis of uh, the available data, I think considering the iconography of the sculptures in those caves, one can place them at a very early date. Elora was not uh, lost in the amnesia. It, was, it seems that it was, it was a living site forever, right since its uh, inception. Because it has been mentioned in ancient uh, literature, in medieval literature, in uh, uh, pre-independence literature. So many European scholars have also talked about it. The earliest references to Elora can be found in the uh, Yadava period. Uh, the references to a cave temple, uh, not exactly Elora, are found in a text called Nyaneshwari, which is a 13th century uh, text, perhaps one of the earliest texts in Marathi. It speaks about a temple which has been carved from top to bottom. Now we do not know whether it is it is Kailashnath, but there is every possibility that it could be Kailashnath because Naneshwara's hometown was not quite far away from, from Kailora. But there is another text which is almost contemporaneous to this called Sthanapothi of Lira Charitra where you find specific references to Elora. Not only that, it seems that the leader of that cult, Chakradhar Swami, he spent four months in Elora and most probably he stayed in cave number 11. There is a place which is, which is shown where he stayed. And in this Thanapoti, he and his disciples keep discussing about Elora. Uh, they visit different, different places, different caves and they keep asking questions. In one of the uh, dialogues, it says that these uh, disciples of Chakradhar they were walking through different caves for several hours and when they came out from some other cave, they saw a village in front of them. And they asked Chakradhar, which village is this? And Chakradhar said, it is Elora village. They said, how come? We have been walking for hours and we have not moved at all. He said, this mountain has been carved thoroughly from within. And though we walked several miles, we are, we are in the same place. Which, which, which means that the, that the mountain was totally hollowed down from within, uh, which could be an exaggeration. But it seems that these caves, many of these caves were interconnected. If you go to Jain caves, you can see that the Jain caves are interconnected. Perhaps similar interconnections were, were uh, there in Buddhist caves and Brahminical caves too. Uh, it also seems that in this particular period, some uh, some uh, esoteric activities were going on in these caves because in one of the dialogues these disciples go to uh, a cave and where they see uh, some people engaged in some some uh, frightening activities uh, this is this is uh, uh, ancient marathi it says nake phulu phulu viti akhe dole mila mila viti ani bhiyan and they got frightened and then their, uh, uh, their uh, teacher tells them that this particular period is the period of uh, these, these uh, 
uh, esoteric practices and you should not be going to these caves at this hour. Which means that Elora was an active esoteric site in 13th century. Uh, perhaps in 14th, 15th century also it continued to be uh, a living site because after 17th century, we know Ailya by Holkar. In 18th century, Ailya by Holkar has renovated this site. If you go to Kailash Nath, you will find some, some very crude uh, painting on the outer walls of Kailash that, that has been done during the period of Ailya by Holkar. From 18th century onwards, there are so many uh, travelogues by European visitors like Sealy, where they talk about the grandeur of Elora. Of course, they don't have very high opinion about the sculpture of Elora because they, they find it very ghastly. They were see, seeing such sculptures with uh, several arms and, and uh, uh, animal heads for the first time. And uh, uh, since they were, their aesthetic ideas were quite uh, uh, Eurocentric or rather Greco-Roman centric, uh, they compare, compare this culture with Greco-Roman sculpture and opine that Greco-Roman Greco sculpture is far superior to this one. The first uh, textual reference to Elora is found uh, on a copper plate which is known as Siddhamshi copper plate. Now again Siddhamshi copper plate is a controversial copper plate because the place mentioned in that particular copper plate was not identified as Elora for a long time. Bhandarkar was the first person to identify that, that place as Kailashnath and then it was associated to this particular cave temple. That uh, copper plate has two beautiful poems on it. One says that when the gods were travelling through the skies, they saw this temple and they were wondering that uh, it cannot be a work of the mortals. The mortals cannot carve out such a temple. And after a long debate, they finally reached a conclusion that the Lord, Lord Shiva himself, must have created this temple as his abode on the earth. Uh, the other stanza says that the sculptor who carved it he tried to do it again and obviously failed and then kept wondering that how could I do it. Uh, perhaps I was, I was, though I was, I was instrumental in carving it, but I am not the person who did it. Uh, if you go up uh, the hill near, near Kailasana temple, there is an attempt of carving another, another cave temple. It seems that this myth must have been born from those attempts which are seen right next to Kailashnath. Unfortunately, uh, unlike Ajanta, Elora doesn't have many inscriptions. Rather, there are three or four major inscriptions. One is in the, in, 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 in the Shavtar cave, that is cave number 15, which is Danti Durga's inscription. It is a long inscription talking about the Rashtrakuta genealogy and Danti Durga's visit to that place. The other inscriptions are very insignificant. There is a small inscription next to the Gajalakshmi image in cave number 16, that is Kalashna. And there are a few more inscriptions in uh, the Jain caves. They are important inscriptions because they also mention the date. Buddhist caves are considered to be the earliest caves by some of the scholars. The physical sequence of the caves is not def definitely not the, not the actual sequence, the chronological sequence of these caves. We don't know how exactly did they choose the sites, but it seems that uh, uh, some cave was carved at a particular place, then another cave was carved on the south of it, the third cave was carved, carved on the north of it. We do not know what exactly was the purpose of choosing these sites. There is no question of dynasty while talking about the uh, Buddhist caves. They were, they were uh, governed by the Buddhist Sanghas. The dynasty which was responsible for the Brahmanical activity could be Kalachuri. Because after the fall of Vakatakal, the Kalachuris entered into this space and they were they were uh, uh, Pashpatashai Vites. Uh, they keep mentioning it time and again in their inscriptions. They call themselves Parama Maheshwara. And uh, they are the people who are responsible for, for Elephanta Caves also. And if you see cave number 14, uh, quite a few sculptures from cave number 14 divulge their Chalukyan origin. Uh, which doesn't mean that the Chalukyans were ruling this region or the activity was patronized by the Chalukyans. Uh, perhaps it was, it was patronized by the Kalachuris, but the Chalukyan guilds were working on it. This, is, this, was common, this was a very common practice in those days that guilds from other regions were invited to work on the projects. If you see Badami, there are so many sculptors from Andhra Desha 
who have worked on the Badami KFC. Like a person like Srinivas Padigal, who has worked on the inscriptions of Badami, has proved that more than 50% of the carvers of Badami came from Andhra region. Their names are Andhraite names. The same could be true about uh, Elora. The carvers must have come from Karnataka. Some carvers were the local carvers. Uh, the later phase that starts from 8th century onwards is obviously the Rashtrakuta phase. And there is a theory that at some juncture, the Rashtrakutas embraced Jainism. Now, most of these theories are debatable theories. But the Jain caves too are attributed to later Rashtrakutas by some of the scholars. But again, unlike, unlike the Hindu caves, the administration and execution of uh, Buddhist and Jain caves was mainly handled by the Sanghas, by the religious uh, groups. I personally think that cave number two is a very important cave because it shows a marked similarity with the ground plan of Ajanta, Ajanta cave. So it speaks, it, it divulges the Ajanta connection of Elora and that is why it is a key cave. The cluster of cave number three onwards, it's a, it's a very complex cluster. Number three, four, five, six, seven, they have been clustered together and uh, you find images of Mahamayuri or images of Tara, uh, images of Bodhisattvas, which speak, speak about the Vajrayana iconography. And that is why they too become very, very significant. Uh, this can be an introduction of Vajrayana, Vajrayana cult in Elora. Cave number 10 uh, is obviously one of the most important caves for two reasons. One, that is the only Chaitya in Elora. Unlike Ajanta, Ajanta has many chaitas. Elora has only one. And the other is perhaps it is the last, uh, uh, last, last uh, uh, rocket chaitya in the history of India. We do not come across any rocket chaitya after this. It's a very elaborate chaitya. It's a two-story uh, uh, chaitya uh, The rest of the things are quite, quite like Ajanta. The, the ground plan, the central nave with, with the flanking eyes and a beautiful image of seated Buddha emerging from the stupa which shows a marked similarity with cave number 26 uh, of, of uh, Ajanta. Cave number 11 and 12 and also cave number uh, 15 are very interesting caves. 11 12 are multi-storied caves and they are almost like hostels. If you talk about the technology of uh, uh, cave temples, technology of rocket caves, these caves have been carved with such tremendous skill and they understand the, the, uh, the uh, uh, structural technology so well that the pillars are placed in such a fashion that they come one, one above the other and they are very spacious uh, caves probably used as hostels. Cave number 11 and 12 has some beautiful sculpture. Cave, cave number 11 has some uh, uh, Vajrayana sculpture in it. Cave number 12 has a beautiful panel of uh, uh, Dhani Buddhas and Manushi Buddhas flanking the Garbhagraha. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very elaborate pa panel, huge panel. Cave number 15 originally was again a cave of this, this kind. It seems that it was abandoned uh, halfway. It is, it is still incomplete. And the upper story has been converted into a Brahmanical cave now. These caves are very significant caves. Uh, cave number 15 perhaps is uh, a laboratory. I call it a laboratory because this is this activity starts after an, a hiatus of several decades and that, that is why uh, the sculpture there is extremely inconsistent. The quality of sculpture, the stylistic features of the sculptures are so inconsistent that you immediately come to know that a large number of guilds have worked on these sculptures. It is not it cannot be attributed to a single guild. Cave number 18 is a very uh, uh, small cave but with a small Nepalese sculpture inside it and that makes it significant because again it speaks about the uh, introduction of uh, Pashpata Shaivism in Elora. 21 perhaps is one of the most beautiful and one of the, one of the real classical caves of this complex. Uh, it is classical in every respect when we talk about classicism in Indian art, 
which normally is attributed to uh, Buddhist art. I think the same classical quality, the same contemplative quality, the same restraint, the composure can be seen in the sculpture of 21. Even the ground plan is very interesting. It has very well lit veranda or uh, hall which is parallel to the facade and uh, there are two upper varnakas, two side chambers on the lateral side of this hall and a garbhagraha in between. So there are not many sculptures in these caves but the size of the sculpture and the quality of sculpture is amazing. There is a beautiful Nandipita also in front of it and a sculpture of Ut Aditi Uttanapada is found on that Nandipita. Now a similar sculpture is found at Elephanta also. That makes it very significant. It, it establishes its connection. 27 is very important because, because there is Vaishnavite sculpture over there. There is an incomplete Shesha shine on one side and the most significant sculpture over there is the sculpture of Ekanamsha. This Ekanamsha sculpture, this the rather the, the, the uh, deity itself almost disappears from Indian, Indian pantheon from 2nd, 3rd century onwards. She, she, is, she, is, she, is, she is considered to be the Yoga Maya of Vishnu. You know what Yoga Maya is. The, you must have heard about the story of Krishna's birth. And the girl, the seventh child, which was, which was ne, the, there is a, there, you know, the eighth child was exchanged. And, and, and a dead girl was handed over to Vasudeva who carried it back to the prison and when, when Kamsa tried to kill that child, that girl escaped from his hand and declared that his enemy is still alive and he is being brought up in, in Gokul. Now that is, that is the uh, deity which, which is identified with Ekanasha. So she is always shown uh, standing between Balabhadra, that is uh, uh, Sankarshan and Vasudeva. So this is the iconography of Ekanamsha which has been described in uh, uh, Sainta and the earlier text. I am of the opinion that though India is full of uh, uh, some very ambitious monuments, the number of guilds was not very large. There are very few guilds who have been working at different places. So it seems that even at Elora, while working on the, on the Shaivite caves, they invited some guilds from Karnataka who were working in cave number 14. This exchange, I think, is very, very important for the further evolution of this style, this interaction. Otherwise, when we are talking about the evolution of a style, no style can, well, if we are talking about a rectilinear evolution, that style has to work in isolation, has to work in insulation which is not possible at a, at a place like Elora, where there are so many guilds working at the same time. The interaction is inevitable. And this interaction can be seen in the later period, where the elements of Chalukyans have been incorporated in the Kalachuri uh, idiom, and the Kalachuri elements have been incorporated into, into the Chalukyan idiom. It gives rise to a very different style later. When it comes to theatricality, I think it is borrowed from Patarakal sculpture. I observe one thing that Patarakal sculpture shows an arrested movement. Like when we, when we do an action, it is a combination of several actions. When I, when I hit at somebody uh, with, a, with, with a sword, I raise the hand and then I bring it back. So there is a fraction of uh, inaction in between. Patarakal sculpture catches that particular moment. So the action is not there, the action is anticipated and that gives a tremendous theatricality to that, that particular sculpture. Now the same theatricality can be seen in some of the sculptures of Elora, particularly in cave number 15. As I told that there are several guilds who have worked in cave number 15 and the, the, the Patarakal guild also has worked over there. there this guild has worked in Cave number 15, it has worked in uh, Kailasana temple also. The, the similarity between the Patarakal sculpture and the Elora sculptures is so obvious that if you mix up these photographs, even a trained eye who has not seen these sites will, be, will, 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 will find it very difficult to separate these images. A particular person from Patarakal, most probably a person called, called Balan, 
has has traveled to uh, Elora and has carved some of the sculptures. Particularly, the first two sculptures in cave number 15, the sculpture of Hiranyakashipu and Narasimha, and the sculpture of Trivikrama, and all the sculptures from the upper register of the main shrine of Kailash Nathar have been carved by a single master. It could be it could be Bal. Uh, now this theatricality, I take it as uh, the inauguration of Baroque in India. Uh, if we if we if we are keen on using this terminology, which normally is uh, borrowed from the from the uh, Western Western art historical uh, theories, but if we really want to identify the Baroque phase in Indian sculpture, this is the beginning of Baroque. The flamboyance, theatricality is followed by flamboyance. So the flamboyance, the grandeur, the dramatic element, all that comes after, after this particular period, which travels to Elora from Patadakal and then uh, grows further in Kailashna. Uh, you must see the uh, Narsimha and Hiranyakashipu sculpture in cave number 15. Uh, their legs are interlocked with each other which is directly borrowed from a small sculpture from Virupaksha temple and their hands are raised and very surprisingly if you see the facial expressions they are smiling at each other they are, they are after each other's life and still they are smiling so it is almost a theatrical, uh, theatrical uh, performance I always tell my students that if you, if you just keep looking at that sculpture you can also hear that sculpture uh, just, just add the sound of chenda to, to that sculpture and it becomes a performance in itself. Kailash. Kailash is a real conundrum. There are so many different beliefs and theories about Kailash. Some of them almost treat Kailash as, 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 as a miracle. There are some people who do not attribute it to the aliens but they think that it must have taken at least 500 years to carve this temple. On the other hand, there are some people like Walter Spin uh, who, who, who say that it has been carved in, in, a, in a period of 20 years. There are some people, and this theory is not Spin's theory, it comes from, from the earlier scholars also, who believe that a trench of 100, 100 feet depth was carved around the central shrine, like the central block was separated from the living rock and then the temple was carved in. Now this is, this is simply ridiculous. If you carve out a trench of that depth, on the, how, do, how would you bring out the stones from, from that trench? Which is, which is practically impossible. So the simple thing is, they must have started carving it from, from top to bottom. And the boulders which were separated from, 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 from around the uh, main shrine were rolled down on the slope of the mountain. That is the easiest way of doing it. If you go to any stone quarry in Rajasthan today, they use the same technique over there that huge boulders are separated by making drills and then those, those boulders which are of the size of a lorry, they are rolled down from, 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 from the slope of the mountain. The, the same technique has time been used in, in Elora also. The masons and the sculptors, they were working hand in hand. The stone was scooped down. And immediately the other team started carving on the details, so so that they don't need need scaffoldings. Uh, without using scaffoldings, they started working on it, and then the stone around the main shrine was gradually uh, carved out and, and and rolled down, and they started working on the actual sculptures, uh, which means that the sculpture on the top of the of the main shrine are the earliest sculptures. And the sculptures in the in the rear veranda are the latest sculptures. If a sculptor wants to carve from the living rock, he has to have enough place to sit and, and enough elbows, elbow space to hit the stone over there. It will take hours to explain the whole uh, yeah. but I can I can briefly say that it has been carved from top to bottom but in a diagonal fashion. I am of the opinion that the work must have started by Nanti Durga and finished by Krishna Deva because normally in the inscriptions it is attributed to Krishna Deva. Uh, the, the total shrine must have taken about 30 years but the, the work continued even in the, in the uh, period of later rulers because 
some of the some of the scholars are of the opinion that the Nadi Devata shrine was carved after the Rashtrakuta conquest of the Triveni Sangam. It seems that even in 9th century, 10th century, 11th century, the work was going on in this complex. And obviously the caves on the lateral side, which certainly is not a part of the original plan of, of that uh, project, were carved much later. And that is why you find a marked similarity between the pillars of those caves and the pillars of the Jain caves. So there is enough reason, even on stylistic grounds, to believe that the work continued at least till 10th, 11th century. 10th century, that definitely. Unlike Ajanta, there is not much of a painting in Elora. But uh, it seems that Elora was uh, profusely painted. Nyaneshwar has uh, said in one of his, one of his ovis, Ki kailasu parade thavarila. The Kailash is looking as if it has been smeared with uh, mercury. There are reminiscences of painting in Kailashnath temple also, particularly in the Mukha Mandapa. There are three layers of painting. The lowermost or the earliest is perhaps the Rashtrakuta period, but the Jain cave is full of painting. Obviously that painting is much later than the uh, Kailashnath painting. And uh, you find the characteristics of Jain manuscript painting in some of those paintings. If you are talking about vandalism, I sincerely wonder whether there are attempts of vandalizing. This is, this is very surprising that we have been told that Aurangzeb was responsible for pulling down so many uh, uh, Hindu monuments. But Khuldawad is just a stone throw away from, from Elora. And, and uh, uh, Aurangabad is not very far. Uh, Dauratabad is, is not very far from uh, Elora. But surprisingly, uh, there is very little deliberate vandalism in Elora. Uh, there must have been, I don't know. But I, I do not come across a very drastic evidence of intentional vandalism in, in Elora. Whatever has happened is mainly happened because of carelessness and uh, complacence. Obviously, the Jain caves is the, is the last activity at Elora. And that could be, which means that after, after the downfall of Rashtrakutas, uh, nobody ventured. Rather, rather, by that time, cave architecture in India almost came to a closure. We do not come across cave architecture after Rashtrakuta period. There is a very interesting theory proposed by uh, Dr. Jamkhedkar, who is a very, very important scholar in this particular area. He said that the same carvers who worked on, on, on cave architecture started working on the forts. Because from Yadava period onwards, they started building forts. And if you, if you have seen the Daulatabad fort, it is a rock cut fort. So they must have started working on the ports and, and the practice of cave architecture came to a closure. The Marathi scholars believe that the description found in Naneshwara's Kuta Kavya, Kuta Kavya is puzzle poetry, is mysterious poetry. Uh, he says, Chinse cha pani eka mandira bandhile adhi kalasamaga payare. A temple was constructed on a tamarind leaf and the uh, finial was, was built first and then the foundation was excavated which is a very interesting imagery. People believe that Naneshwar must have visited this place and said, I personally think that Elora itself is a Kuta Kavya. Elora, Elora itself is a mysterious poem carved in stone.